the New Testament. We are a part of the New Testament church, but um, still the Old Testament is important. So I wanted to draw your attention to a gentleman tonight. Um, I know Randall has done some studying on this gentleman. I know that there's others I'm sure that have. He's not hidden away. He's right out there in front of us, and his name's Nehemiah. And so I wanted us to go to the book of Nehemiah tonight. And Lord willing, we'll just look at chapter 1. We'll look at chapter 1 tonight and try to draw from, from this passage. The Bible says, The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, and it came to pass in the month Chislu, in the twentieth year, as I was in Shushan the palace, that Hananiah, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass, when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven and said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant which I pray before thee now, day and night. For the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee, both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against thee, and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments, which thou commandest thy servant Moses. Remember, I beseech thee, the word that thou commandest thy servants Moses, saying, If ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But if ye turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though there were of you cast out unto the uttermost part of the heaven, yet will I gather them from thence and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Now these are thy servants and thy people, whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants, who desire to fear thy name and prosper. I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. Lord, again, thank you for this time together with these men. Thank you for uh, speaking to my heart. Lord, I pray now that you would bring to our hearts and bring to our minds what you want us to understand from this passage. I pray that your Holy Spirit will teach us that he will speak that whatever we need to understand, we would understand it. Lord, whatever needs to be said, Lord, if it's thy will, have me say it. And please keep me from saying things that I shouldn't. I pray, Father, for your divine intervention, your, it's more than an intervention, Lord, it's, it's an invasion. I pray, Father, that you would just invade our hearts and our minds with what's in front of us. Thank you for what you're going to do, Lord. Please keep me from saying things that I shouldn't or saying them with the wrong heart. 
In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, the first thing we want to notice tonight is the meaning of Nehemiah's name. Lots of times we do that. Uh, it's very common among the Hebrews, and it's even common among uh, other cultures that when they name someone, it means something. My, I, I joke with my wife about being Native American and things like that. She's Native American and Scottish. And so I, I, I lean into the Native American part, and I keep trying her to get some of that, you know, that money that Native... <laughs> no, I'm joking, I'm joking. But uh, she... She, in that culture, the Native American culture, their names most definitely meant something many, many years ago. That's why you had so many different, what well, we would call them odd, but what I was told traditionally that when a child was born, they were named after what the father or someone saw either physically or maybe even saw in a dream or a vision. That's what the child was named. So... Nehemiah, uh, when we look at his name, it's, it's, it means comfort or consolation. Uh, it means to be sorry or to comfort. And, and it, it, when you look at it, it kind of, it, he lived up to his name, it sounds like. In these moments right here, he was living up to what his parents named. And now, I don't think, to be honest, unless they received some kind of insight from God, I don't know, I don't have any biblical revelation or recollection that when Nehemiah's parents, when he was brought into the world, that they knew Nehemiah was going to be used the way Nehemiah was used. And if you go and study the entire book of Nehemiah, you find he was used to rebuild the walls around the city of Jerusalem that had been destroyed. I don't know that they knew that about him, but they named him what they named him, and, and he is living up to his name. Now, some of us here tonight may have names that uh, mean things. Uh, your name, I know what your name means because my son's name is the same. Jacob means trickster, you know, and sometimes maybe they do live up to their names. I don't know. And, and so, but... Let's say it this way. The Bible teaches us is that as a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. So when you consider when people use your name, when they call your name, when they speak of your name in, in, to someone else, what are they saying? What could be said about your name? Do you have a good name? Because it's more important than having great riches. What people think about you and what they know you to be. And now I'm going to take it further. It's really important that if people, if you have a good name, it's really important that everybody that knows you thinks the same thing. I'm going to talk a little bit about there's people who have a public life and then there's people who have a home life. There are men who have a public life and in public they've got a really good name. But at home it's not so good. The wife really doesn't have the same level. It's sad, but it's true. She doesn't really feel the same way that even other women in public may feel about him. She could have it in the back of her heart, in the back of the, her mind, oh, if you, really, if you knew him, you wouldn't be praising him the way that you do. I think that's probably one of the greatest tra tragedies. It's this word that we call duplicity. It's where we can honestly be one thing in public, something else at home, and even something else in private. Does this make, I hope I'm making sense. And what we should want and what we should be striving for is that the, when, when 
yes, that we, we, we should be striving to have a good testimony in public, but we should also be striving to have a good testimony in our homes, but we will have both of those if we have a good testimony before God alone, when I'm alone. Now, I would love to tell you that I have never been a part of duplicity, but that would not be true. It would not. It would be a lie. There have been moments and times in my life when the way I was in public was not the way I was being in private. You know what you can do. I hope you understand this. You can repent of that. You can be forgiven of that. You can, honestly, God can fix all of that. The wonderful thing about Jesus is that Jesus can really change everything, and, and he does. So when we look at his name, then the second thing I want you to notice uh, is verse number one. I want you to look at the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, and it came to pass in the month of Chislu, in the 20th year as I was in Shushan, the palace. Now, the next thing I want you to notice is the time, or what we would say the month. I want you to understand the practical side of it and then make a spiritual point or a, a uh, maybe that's the right word, the month he was living in. It was Chislu. Now, here's what this month is in our calendar. It's, it's like November, December time of the year, okay? So he was in that time of the year that we're about to enter into, and it says that he was in Shushan, the palace. That's the place. We'll get to that here in just a little bit. So he is in the time of the year where things are starting to seemingly slow down. You're, you're not planting. You're not, um, you're not harvesting. The harvest is coming to an end. And you're entering into that, that, that time in the year as... I used to love this time more when I was a kid because things would slow down, and it, or at least it seemed like, and you'd got your Thanksgiving break, right, from school, and it used to be longer. So you got your Thanksgiving break, and then after you got through with your Thanksgiving break, you went back to school for a few weeks, and then you was on your Christmas break, you know. And so it was like there was more of a sense of gatherings and things of that nature. Now, interestingly enough, jumping to the place... He says that he was in Shushan, the palace. Now, when you study what Shushan was, it was literally the winter palace. It was where the kings would go and stay. Not the kings of Israel, because remember, Nehemiah is in bondage at this time, okay? So this would have been the kings of Persia would be a good way of saying it. And so the Persian kings, they had this place where they would go and winter. And it was Shushan. So let's get a mental picture now and maybe even uh, allow ourselves to absorb it a little bit emotionally. This is where he was at. He was in a warm, cozy palace that was set up for the king and his family. Nehemiah is not the king, but he's the king's cupbearer. We'll talk about that. Nehemiah, is, he's in, really, he's in a, a place of, he's in a good spot. Winter's coming, he's not going to get cold. Winter's coming, he's not going to get hungry. You see, he is in a place where uh, it's time to just kind of pull the quilt around and, and ease into the rest of the year. Now, sometimes, if we're not careful, we'll... we'll will fail to look at winter another way. So let's grab a hold of this. Even though Nehemiah was in the palace, Shushan, sitting comfortable, the rest of his brethren were in the positions they were in. So what was getting ready to happen for them? Here's what was getting ready to happen for them. Darkness was going to be longer than shorter. The days were getting shorter, the nights were getting ready to get longer. So we could say it this way, making a spiritual application, it was getting actually getting darker around him. Does this make sense? For everybody else, 
that wasn't going to be in the king's palace. It was going to get colder for everybody else. So things were getting actually darker. Things were actually getting colder. Things were dying. It's looking more like death. Is this, is this making a sense to you guys? And so if, if we're not careful, we're not going to consider that there are people who are... The, the, guys, the world's getting darker. And it's getting darker for individuals. I, I, the Lord's blessed me, and, and why? I, he's just because He's good and He's faithful. Some would say that Chris Grinstead has had some longevity in ministry. We're approaching 30 years of, of, of pastoring. And for, 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 by some measurements, that's a pretty lengthy time, you see. And, but here's, I don't mean this, I don't know how else to say it, but the problems that come to my couch in my office are not the same kind of problems I was dealing with 30 years ago. Well, what do you mean? It's like there's, there's more darkness. There's more despair. There's more discouragement. Um, I know you see the statistics. I know you read the statistics. Suicide is epidemic. Um, one of the things that, that actually my, my daughter had to teach me because of the degree that she has and the work that she has done and the work that she continues to do, the suicide training that she's had. And she sat down with me one time and, and I was talking to her about a conversation I had and she said, well, Dad, here's the first thing you gotta do. You need to understand you're just trying to get them to live one more day. Just one more day. You're, you're, not, going to, you're, you're not going to be able to dive over into and solve... He, when he, and she taught me some things. One of the things she asked, she told me, she says, you go ahead and ask them, what's your plan? How do you plan to do it? And she said, if a person is genuinely talking about suicide, they will genuinely tell a counselor how they plan to do it. I wouldn't have known that. They didn't even touch that in Bible college. You see what I'm saying? I thank God that they taught me the Bible, but they didn't even tell me what kind of questions to ask, Brother Jimmy. You went to Bible college. Did they ever tell you? No. So I hope I'm, I hope I'm making sense. And so just understanding, okay, I'm talking to someone. They're talking this way. And then you say, okay, well, you know, and, and you're hoping, well, I hadn't really went that far. But when they tell you their plan, oh, what do I do now? What do I do now? You just try to keep them alive one more day. You just try to let them know there's a reason for you to stay alive today. Yes, Is this making sense? You say, well, why are you sharing this with us? That's, that's becoming more and more and more a problem, and it is not, it, it's not just among the youth. It's not just among the middle-aged. It's among every area of Every, every level of, of age. Why? The, it's getting darker around us, y'all. The hopelessness is getting stronger. Satan has lied so much, and people are believing so much. Here's what we know about the devil, right? He wants to kill, steal, and destroy. That's what he wants. Who said that? Jesus did. Jesus said, this is what he wants to do. Kill, steal, and destroy. What's the situation here? Well, the truth is, Nehemiah, he's like, I'm sitting in the king's palace in Shushan. I'm not sitting in the summer palace where the walls aren't as thick as they are in Shushan. I am in the winter palace. Why? Because winter is coming. The days this is another thing. The days were going to get shorter. What can this say to us spiritually? Time. Running out of time. Jesus says, I must do the works of my Father while it is day. 
for the night cometh when no man can work. You remember Jesus saying that in the Gospels? There is this reality, folks. There is this honest-to-goodness truth. We are running out of time. Time. When I say time, I'm talking about as far as man is concerned. God's eternal. God operates on the outside of, out of, outside of time. God has given us eternal life. But for man, humanity, folks, there is a time. And we're getting there. If you could tonight uh, picture the hours, picture the... Uh, Sand in an hourglass. Yeah, I hope y'all never watched Days of Our Lives. But when, when I was a kid, my mom set me down every day with her. And when I was four years old, we would sit down every day, and it was my nap, supposed to be my nap time. So I was supposed to be asleep while she watched soap operas. My father hated that. But at any rate, as, like the sands in the hourglass, so are the days of our lives. I learned that when I was four years old, okay? So I may have said fourth grade. I meant to say four years old. So we see the, the month. That's the time of the year. We see the place where he was staying. He was in a place of comfort. He was in a place of coziness. He and the king's family, they were settling in for the winter. They were settling in, just preparing, and just going to, Hang in there until the winter passed. Verse number 11, I want you to notice his position. We'll jump all the way to verse 11. O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name and prosper. I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, talking about the king, for I was the king's cup bearer. So this lets us know a little bit something else about Nehemiah. Ne Nehemiah wasn't just cozy. Nehemiah had it pretty cushy. When you were the king's cup bearer, here's what you did. You dressed better than all the other servants. Why? Because you were going to be seen by other kings. When the king would sit down... When there was anybody that he wanted to impress, whatever the case may be, you would be at every event, every venue, every, every meal, whether it be the family meal or whether it be a banquet. If we understand kingdoms the way the Bible seems to explain it to us, there would be multiple people sitting at the king's table on any given there would be polit what we would call politicians. There would be sheriffs. There would be what we would call senators. Those type of people that would be having meals with the king. So Nehemiah would be, he, he would be well-dressed. He would be well-fed. Okay. What would he eat? He would eat the same thing the king ate. What would he drink? He would drink the same thing the king drank. This was a cushy job. What was, the, what was the one pitfall about it if someone tried to kill the king? If someone tried to kill the king, if they were going to try to poison the king, he was, if I would have been Nehemiah, and I think it's a fair assumption, I would have been also in there during the preparation of every meal. <laughs> I would have known. Well, I, know, I would have known where that hot dog came from, you know. I would have, you, you see what I'm saying? Because... That's what he did. He bore the cup, king's cup bearer. He would taste the food. He would do everything. And the reason it was so important, and, and if you'll go on in the book of Nehemiah, you'll find that Nehemiah, because of what he learns, comes into the presence of the king, and he doesn't look good. And the king says, what's wrong with you? And we would understand, why would the king want to know what's wrong with you? Are you sick? Because if you're sick, it means that we had a meal last night and it's now starting to affect you and it's probably going to start affecting me in just a few hours. Does this make sense? Yes. And so, uh, so he was saying, basically Nehemiah is praying that we, he would find, look at what it says, that, that, that uh, uh, grant me mercy or grant him mercy in the sight of this man. 
what's happened, Nehemiah, and that's where we'll get to now, not just his position, but I want you to notice the state of his brethren. So when we look at this, verses 1 and 2, Nehemiah lets us know where he is. Verse number 2 lets us know who shows up at the palace. Who is it? It's Nehemiah's brethren. It's the Hebrew people have come to the palace. And they said unto me, verse 3, he asked concerning Jerusalem, how is Jerusalem? They said unto me, the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down and the gates thereof are burned with fire. They're setting ducks. There's, they're open. There's nothing keeping out the bad. Nothing. The walls are down. When he, when he sees this, he's hearing the state of his brethren. Now, where is he? He's it's cozy, it's cushy, it's not so bad. How is it with his brethren? Affliction. Where's he at? His position. He's not in a position of reproach. He's in a, he's in a position of status. He's not just a servant. He's a servant of, among servants. He's got some authority on how things go. How are his brethren? They're in reproach. They are not looking so good. When you look at that, what is his reaction? And this is point number six. What is his reaction? Let's look. And when it came to pass, when I heard these words, um, I, we, I, I'm, I'm, I, I shouldn't say we, that's not fair. I am guilty of allowing myself to become desensitized. I'm guilty of that. I'm guilty of hearing so much bad that it's, well, I just got to get, I just got to get to work. I don't mean this to sound wrong. I understand that you guys, many of you, you're, you're getting up early in the morning and you're getting to work. I don't mean this, no one's ever accused me here that I know of of being lazy. But what I would say to you is, guys, I get up at 5 o'clock every morning too, and I get to work, okay? Now, my work may not be putting in windows, but sometimes it is around here. You know, sometimes I'm holding something for somebody. <laughs> but uh, my, my point is this. Even as, I'm, I don't know about other preachers' lives. I almost said wives. I don't know about other preachers' lives. I don't know how their ministries are. I just know how this ministry is, okay? And the, one of the things about this ministry that, and it's probably due to my own personal personality, we've got a lot going on. And I tell people jokingly, we're the biggest little church in Georgia. <laughs> we're a small congregation, but we've got big ideas. We've got, a, we got you know... And so what, what are you saying? I'm saying all that to say this, not for a pat on the back, but to, just to prove, help you understand my point. I honestly do understand what it's like to get in a mode, even though I'm the preacher and I hope you don't think bad of me, I understand what it's like to get into the mode, uh, yeah, I just heard that, but I got to get to work. I understand that. I understand that I got to get this done. I got to get that done. I hope I'm making sense. May God help me. May God help me, maybe even you, to do what Nehemiah did. Yes, what did he do? And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down. That's the first thing he did. What's the first thing he did? He stopped what he was doing. What was he doing? I don't know. 
he may have been checking the, the, the lettuce. He may have been checking the wine. He may, have been, he may have been in the process. He may have been saying, you know, it could have been, we don't know, but these men come into the palace, his brethren, they come to the palace. He says, how's it going? Have you ever asked somebody how they're doing? And let's be honest, you don't have to say it out loud, but you, you wished you hadn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, sir. <laughs> And so you say, how you doing? And they tell you. <laughs> yeah. Well, here, here's the reality. I don't know exactly what the context was. I tend to think that he was honestly wanting to know. I have, I have a tendency to think he was really being sincere and asking. But he's, he's doing, and, and what he heard caused him to sit down. I got some really good news many, many years ago, about 27, 28 years ago, that uh, my wife was pregnant for our, with Hannah, our first child. It was good news with Rachel, it's good news with Jacob. But with your first one, it's kind of like, what, you know? And I remember it caused me to sit down. Thank the Lord there was a chair behind me because she came out of the, the bedroom with, you know, you go and they do the test and she come in and she goes, well, it's, it's, we're, we're, we're pregnant, we, we're pregnant. And all I remember was backing up like a Fred Sanford moment. I remember backing up, and some of these guys don't even know who Fred Sanford is. I remember backing up and sitting down on my chair and saying, things are going to change. That's all I remember saying, and things are going to change. And so um, that's a good thing to hear that would cause you to sit down. But there are times, folks, when some bad things, we, we, we need to not, we need to not be desensitized by God's grace to go ahead and say what I am hearing, I need to set down here. I need to set down. Maybe, maybe I even just need to set down with these men that are giving me this information right now. Every now and then, it's okay, guys. It really is. Here's one thing that I've learned. I hope you've learned it too. What you had to get done, it'll still be there. Yeah, that's right. It'll still be undone because you're the one that's got to do it, right? And if you're the one that's got to do it, it'll, 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 it'll still be undone. So all I'm saying is in Forsyth County and the surrounding counties in this fast pace that you can feel, you can fly out west, land here. When Jacob and Sydney landed the other night, and we're, and we're coming to a family huddle, right? They, they said we, they got off the plane to come, and they said immediately they realized, oh, my goodness, it's fast-paced around here. And they were talking about that they had to start walking faster or they were going to get ran over in the airport. I know this is the world in which we live, and I know the county in which we live, right? Some of y'all have been living here your whole lives. You have seen it speed up. Right? Well, sometimes we've got to just sit down. That's what Nehemiah did. It's the first thing he did. The first thing he did was sit down. And see, when he sat down, look at what happens next. And I heard these words that I sat down and looked and wept. Maybe it happened simultaneously. But here's what I'm learning about myself if I don't take time to allow what's being said to me to not let it, if I don't take the time to let it affect me, it doesn't affect me. But if I will go ahead and let it affect me, it may bring me to tears. It, it may genuinely really affect me. So just to kind of reiterate what we've been looking at so far we honestly, by God's grace, we honestly need to let the things that are going on in our world affect us. And they might not if we don't set down. This is something that we don't like doing. Most of us, God forgive us, but most of us have a, some form of constant mental stimulus. We want to keep our minds stimulated. And let me say it, I'm not throwing stones at you, but I'm going to tell you why Chris Grinstead 
wants his mind stimulated. You ready? I don't want to think. I don't want to think. I don't want to think about how bad it is. I don't want to think about how dark it is. I don't want to think that we're running out of time. Are you hearing me? Why? Because it could break my heart. It could bring me to the place that it brought Nehemiah. One of the things that uh, has been shared with me that um, it's one of the it's one of the it's one of the I'm going to connect these two together. Oh my word! I'm running out of time. I had, I'm sorry, guys. But one of the things that has blessed me recently was a, was a book that I read by Kerry Schmidt. And he was actually talking about successful people. And one of the issues that successful people have, but it's one of the blessings of success, believe it or not, is because we, he, and he was using the analogy of, um, how shall I say it? Yeah, analogy of, High mountain climbers, men who climb high mountains, okay? Not the mountains, not even the mountains where I'm from. I'm talking about high mountains. There was a gentleman, I've forgotten his name, but he had climbed all the highest peaks in the world. There was not one summit that he had not reached. He's climbed them all. And he had gotten so good at mountain climbing, so good at the planning, body, everything the way it should be, he now, his mindset was, now I'm going to climb them all in a certain amount of time. Because there's certain things that your body goes through that you have to recuperate, and he's like, I'm going to climb them all in a certain amount of time. And so that's what he did. He took on the first mountain, and it, so he's, he's pulling off at this, this thing of success, and then he gets to the peak of one of the, one of the high mountains, and he, he thinks to himself, because one of his climbing mates ran out of oxygen. He's like, it's cool, I got you, you're good, because the other guy's flipping out. He's like, I got you, and he gives, he gives that man his oxygen tank. He gives the other climber his oxygen tank. Why? Because he honestly believed that he could climb the summit without the oxygen. You say, what's your point? Success has a crazy way of making you think you can do more than you really can. It's dangerous. It's dangerous. You, 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 you pull this off. Hey, you pull this off. Everybody with me? You pull this off. Yeah, you pull this off. And if you're, if you're not careful, you'll start thinking, I'm different than everybody else. I don't need to sit down. I'm not affected. I hope I'm making sense. And you know, he almost died on that mountain. Why? Because he gave the other man his oxygen. Now, that sounds very heroic, doesn't it? You say, what did he do? i tell you what he do, did. He started hallucinating. According to the story, he started hallucinating. He started, listen, this is very important, and it'll help you. He started seeing monsters that weren't real. Make that spiritual application. You'll start seeing monsters. You'll start seeing threats. How does this come about? Success after success after success. Reaching height after height after height. With success comes paranoia. If you're not careful, you'll start thinking that everybody in the office is after your job. People gunning. Is this making sense? And so when he... When he got up there, he started hallucinating. He started seeing, he, the story goes, he actually saw monsters that weren't real. You say, well, how is, did he live? Yeah, he lived. How? By coming down the mountain. That was his only hope. If he'd have kept climbing, if he'd kept taking the attitude, I got to get to the next level. I got to get to the next success. You understand what I'm saying? I've got to reach this peak. If he'd have kept that prideful stubbornness, he'd have died. He had to say, you know what? I'm just like that guy that needed the oxygen. I need the same tank that he needs. But I've already given mine away. He had to let that guy keep on climbing. Are you listening? 
I hope this is helping. He had to let that guy keep on climbing. And he had to descend. And he didn't break his record. He didn't do what he wanted to do. But you know what he did do? He lived to see another day. Is this, I hope this is making sense. Where is Nehemiah right here? Among his brethren. Who are they coming to see? Is Nehemiah going to see them? No. Is Nehemiah going to go to appeal to these men? The brethren are in affliction. You understand what I'm saying? No. They're coming to where he is. What does he do? He allows what they're going through to affect him on the level that it caused him to sit down and weep. That's what it says. He allowed himself to be affected by what others were going through. When we look at this, I heard these words that I sat down and wept and look, what, look and look what he says, and mourned. He had a sense of loss. There was a sense of, of identifying with their loss as his loss. If we are not careful, brothers, if we are not careful, we can be Christians <laughs> that think that we are, well, I'm trying to word it right. It's not good to look at another human being and see what they're receiving because of the world being dark, because of the world being full of sin. It's not good to look at another human being and say, well, yeah, that's what they, that's what they should be getting because it's sin. I understand that. But, but, but I thank God that isn't how, that wasn't Christ's attitude towards human beings. If Christ's attitude towards humans was, yes, you should get exactly what you deserve. It was the opposite. Absolutely. Absolutely. He looked at us and became one of us. He lowered himself to become like us. We've got to, we got to, we, we, it is, gang, it's, it's, and I'm going to try to be careful to say things right. I am, I'll, just, I'll just put it back here. I have been guilty of looking at other men's lives and thinking, yeah, of course it's ended up like that because you were an idiot. I'm sorry, but I have. I've been guilty of that. Well, who, 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 did, that, who did that benefit? It really didn't make me any better. It really didn't. And it definitely didn't make him any better. I hope this is making sense. It's been better when my spirit has been, you know what, that could be me. I, I'm, I'm one decision away from that being me. That could be me. You all know uh, my, my little brother, you know where he died, died in prison. And I've had to do a lot of repenting since his death. I've had to do a lot of repenting, asking God to forgive me. Why? But you want to know the truth of the matter is we grew up in the exact same house with the exact same parents. You say, well, well you must have been better than him. That's a foolish notion. I used to think that. I used to think I was better than him. I wasn't. I wasn't better than him. You know what happened? Satan got a hold of him in some areas that he didn't get a hold of me. Satan's got a hold of me in some areas. But in particular areas, he just didn't get a hold of us in the same place. But he could have. I am where I am doing what I'm doing by the grace of God. Amen. And y'all know the story. You know he got saved. For those of you who don't know the story, he got saved in prison. And hallelujah for that. Died there, but he died. I'll see him in heaven. 
without a doubt. So, what's your point? My point is, there are people, men, in this world, they are in dark places, dealing with dark things, and they are running out of time, and it's only getting colder, it's only becoming more like winter for them. And the least we can do, this is where we'll pause for tonight, the least we can do is at least sit down and think about it and let it hurt our hearts. Let us lose our judgment and just honestly hurt for our fellow human beings that are going through very difficult times. Was it bad decisions that got them there? Yes. Yes, it was. Is it sin? Yes, it is. Are we hearing this? Because when, you, when we study, well, Lord will, and we'll look at it again, when we come back and look at Nehemiah again, you're going to find out that Nehemiah 100% acknowledges they are in the state that they are in because of sin. That's not, he's, he's not dodging it, Okay. But we'll also see something interesting about that as well. Okay? Everybody okay? Yes, All right. Let's pray. Father, again, I thank you for these men. I thank you for their families. I thank you for your blessings upon them, many of them, Lord. Um, you know their stories. And I'm trusting, Lord, that every man in here has experienced your saving grace, your redemption. And so, Lord, I thank you for that. If there is one here tonight that has not trusted you as his Savior, I pray, God, tonight that you would speak to his heart and that he would just lean in and lean on you and trust you. And he would come to you, Lord. I pray that you will speak to my heart in this, not that this wouldn't just be words said, but there would be actions that would follow these words that you've preached to us tonight. In the name of your son, Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.